Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, it is my delight and pleasure to welcome you to today's episode of Light Bites, uh, big subject, bite-sized. Um, I'm Jake, the marketing executive over at Training Bite Size, and it's been absolutely wonderful hosting these episodes uh, of Light Bites for you over the last few weeks. Um, so today we are looking at um, another key topic from the APM PMQ Box 7 syllabus, and that is scheduling and critical path. Um, but before we jump on in, um, I would just like to say just a couple of things about who we are at Training Bite Size and what we do and how we can help you. Um, so we are a family owned and run business uh, based in lovely Nantwich in the heart of Cheshire. And uh, we have over 20 years of experience in delivering industry leading training and certifications to individuals and organizations alike. Um, we are a leading provider of APM training going all the way from your PFQ foundations all the way through to um, CHPP status, so your Chartered Project Professional status. Um, we offer a huge number of ways to study, whether that's face-to-face, -face, uh, self-paced online learning, on-site, uh, or blended, uh, which is kind of a mixture of online learning and face-to-face. -face. Uh, so we are so experienced and we really enjoy tailoring learning solutions to suit you. Um, that's enough about me and training bite size. Um, I would just like to introduce you very briefly to our fantastic trainer for the day, Mr. Callum Downing. Um, Callum is a professional project management trainer and consultant with over 12 years experience in delivering uh, training and delivering projects. Um, he is one of our specialist APM trainers and has trained hundreds of, uh, of, of uh, APM delegates around the world. So it's safe to say he knows the subject matter back to front, inside out, and like the back of his hand. So without further ado, I, uh, it is my pleasure to hand you over to, uh, to Callum to lead the session. Thank you very Brilliant. much, Callum. Thank you very much, Jake. Yeah, and as Jake said, my name is Callum. Um, I teach the APM stuff for Bite Size, Training Bite Size. Uh, and today we're going to look at uh, scheduling. Um, so this is an interesting topic for me. In fact, it's probably if I was to pick a topic that was my favourite, probably this one. <laughs> as nerdy and boring as that sounds. I'd say this is probably one of my favorite topics to teach and to, to do in projects as well. Um, <clears throat> so I'll try, there's quite a lot to cover, so I'll try to kind of get through it. There's, there we should be time for questions as well, but there's quite a lot to get through, so I'll, I'll be as uh, succinct as I possibly can. So here's just a quick breakdown of how scope ties into schedule. So we need to have got our objectives and requirements and uh, breakdown structures need to have been figured out. So particularly our work breakdown structure, we need a work breakdown structure in order to help us with our schedule. Once we've got our work breakdown structure, we can then start doing what's called an activity network. You may have heard it called a network diagram or precedence network. It's got a number of different names, but it's effectively dependencies between tasks. That will enable us to build a Gantt chart, which will enable us to develop our resource histogram, which is where we allocate resources. And that will allow us to optimize our project. So leveled and smooth resources is optimization of resources. And that will give us a, that will allow us to show our resources across the project with a resource S curve, accumulative totals. So <clears throat> scoping is a whole different thing. So I'm not going to dwell too much on scoping, but just wanted to show you this. This is a work breakdown structure. So this is going to show all the tasks we have to do in our project. We work this out, we figure this out based on the, the requirements and say, right, what work do we have to do to put all these pieces of our project together? The thing is, this is a hierarchy. It looks like a family tree. So what this work breakdown structure will not show, despite showing the tasks, it will not show the order of the tasks. So that's what we do with scheduling. We start off with... Um, uh, taking our work breakdown structure and drawing what's called a network diagram or precedence network or activity network. <clears throat> so this is effectively, this is, this is again, this is one of my favorite things to do. I love doing this. So we take our work breakdown structure and say, right, we need to put that into a logical order. And we do that by saying, what's the relationship between tasks? So in this instance, if A is dependent on B, um, then um, so what that means is if B is dependent on A, sorry, is once A is finished, B can then begin. And the one below there, and if C and D are dependent on B, then we're saying once B is finished, then C and D can begin. So we effectively take our work breakdown structure, all these tasks, and we put them into an order, a logical sequence that is effectively going to be a picture of how your project is going to be. This is an example of a 
precedence network or a network diagram or activity network. And this shows we the order we do our tasks in and it shows the relationships between them. So finish to start, this is known as, where we have arrows going out to the right-hand side of one task and to the left-hand side of another. That's finish to start. It means that in this instance, that once activity A is finished, activity B and C can then begin. Once activity B and C are finished, activity D can begin and activity E can begin. So it just gives us an idea of the flow, the natural way of doing the project, the best, most logical way of carrying out the project. So that's just the introduction bit. Um, just to go make sure I've got plenty of opportunities for questions. Are there any questions anyone wants to ask just based on those very, that very brief introduction to scheduling there? Um, Callum, I had a brief question. Yep. Um, so <clears throat> just because it's, um, I'm not sure whether the terminology is right or not, so I'm, I'm going to just ask whether this is correct. Um, I've often uh, known that to be called a dependency network. Yep. Is, yep. is that, yeah. That's, so, yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, they, they have, I, I, always, I always just go precedence network because it covers as many <laughs> different variations of the name it can possibly be. Um, but it is, if I go back to it a second, the arrows are showing dependencies. So dependency network is, I mean, the network bit is often the bit that gets left in. The, the bit before it changes, but network is the key thing. So you could simplify this and just say it's a network diagram. Um, so yeah. Okay, um, just to sort of follow up on that then, um, when it comes to uh, drawing the, the dependency network, the precedence network, um, who is it that kind of takes charge of, of doing that? Right, that depends on the, the organization you work for. So if you're working in a more or a small, a smaller organization, it may be that the project manager and their project and the direct team might develop a network. Um, where I come from in defense, I used to work for the Ministry of Defense. Um, that's where I worked primarily, that's where I got my project management experience from. We had a whole team of people called project schedulers and they were the ones who managed the network and effectively the project manager would oversee it. So they wouldn't necessarily be writing the network. I mean, it's quite common for the project manager not to be writing or developing the, the network, but delegating the task to their team and then just checking it. Um, so it might be there's a dedicated team of people who are whose role it is in the organization to develop networks. It may be that um, the project manager writes it if it's a smaller project. Um, it may be a particular person in a team is delegated the authority to write the network, but I've always found that they work best when you workshop them. Um, so it's not just, it shouldn't really be handled by a person, I don't think, especially for more complicated projects. It should be a, a group effort, kind of group of experts. Again, this is why I enjoy it. It's kind of, you, you're basically, it's like a puzzle. You take all the, you have all your pieces, your work breakdown structure pieces and go, right, let's jumble them. They're all jumbled up at the moment. We need to put them into an order. And if you work with somebody to do a puzzle, it's always easier. So, you know, it's that situation. If you have those experts, if you have a dedicated team of schedulers who know their stuff, who understand the kind of the puzzle pieces, but then need to give, be given direction about you know what the the, the root of the project is going to be, or the key key parts of the project, or key tasks of the project. The project manager needs some input too, but they may not be the one actually developing it. But it depends. It really depends. To be honest with you. Fair enough. No, that that makes that makes perfect sense. And um, if anybody else does have any other questions, either now or throughout the uh, throughout the session, you can visit our Mentimeter if you go to menti.com and use the code 36868843 and that'll take you straight to the uh, straight to the question slide. Um, you can also scan the QR code that is uh, currently showing on the screen uh, that will work with uh, with any smartphone um, or you can pop them into a, into the Zoom chat. So uh, feel free to keep asking those questions all the way throughout the session and we will try and get through as many as we can. But for now I'm going to hand back to Callum and we're going to kind of uh, move on to the next stage. Lovely. And there will be plenty of opportunity for questions in this one as well. There's loads of other opportunities. So don't feel you've missed out if you haven't asked a question yet or haven't had time. OK, right. So to be, so how I think of um, scheduling, I kind of think of it in a few different steps. And for me, I need to get to something called a critical path analysis. So in order to get to a critical path analysis, I must have a work breakdown structure. I must then do my network diagram, precedence network, dependency network, activity network, but network which is putting all those tasks into order and before i can do critical path analysis and then that will which will then allow me to build a gantt chart i need to work out how long all those tasks take so we do this thing called estimating estimating is this it's a guess but it's more than a guess it's an informed guess we've gathered some information usually historic of some kind to help us make our guess more robust make it more reliable 
there are several estimating approaches we can do. There are two uh, top-down methods and there's two bottom-up methods. So one of the top-down methods is parametric. So this is a look at historic data, a database of, of, that we've gathered over time based on, usually based on experiences. So the one I, the analogy you can always think of with this is when a, someone, if you hire a builder to do some work for you, like, you know, do a kitchen or an extension or whatever, they'll, you, you give them your details, say, look, I want you to build me an extension. Um, could you give me an idea of how much it's going to cost? They will then draw on their database of experience. They've done building for 20 years or something. They have a huge database of knowledge. They know how much their time is worth, how much materials cost and how much, um, how long it will take to do things and how big and how much it will cost based on how big the area you want it to be is. And they will have this database of information they can then use to pull an estimate out of. So parametric estimating the database of historic statistical uh, uh, experience pretty much that allows us to develop an estimate from that so builders use it uh, businesses use it to kind of look let's look at historic data and then make an estimate based on a variety of historic data analogous is when you compare to a historic project so you say how much so rather than go, going to a builder and saying i want you to give me a quote on my extension you see the neighbor down the street had an extension a couple of years ago and you ask them how much did it cost to build your extension um, I'm after something similar and they go, oh, it's about 20 grand. Okay, well, I can, I have a ballpark figure then for mine. So when we compare to a previous project, analogous estimating, we want it to be as close as possible. We want to make it as similar in terms of scope and scale as, as we possibly can, because the closer it is, the more accurate our estimate will be. We tend to find analogous is one of the first estimates we tend to use, especially for our business cases. We say, right, we need to figure out how much we want to budget for this project to get an idea of how much we want to budget less compared to previous projects then. Two bottom up methods then, we have analytical, which is where you develop a breakdown structure. So this is where you go back to your work breakdown structure, you have your hierarchy and you work out how much each individual small piece of work would be. So rather than saying, how much does it take, how long does it take to decorate a bedroom? It's how long does it take to fit a light bulb? And then you work out how much, how long it takes to fit a light bulb, how long it takes to paint the, you know, one wall, how long it takes to do the carpet, how long it takes to do the um, the wiring, how long it takes to to um, fit a bed, etc. And then you you work it all out, add it up. So it's breaking your project down into all its component parts, all its tiniest pieces of task, and then working up. Hence, bottom up estimate. You get you break it down, then you work from the bottom of the hierarchy up, and that will give you an overall estimate. It tends to be very much more accurate, more reliable than analogous in particular, because analogous is looking at someone else's project, a historic or a previous project, it could be your previous project to be fair as well. But analytical is not looking at a previous project, it's looking at your own project broken down into detail. So it tends to be more reliable, but it doesn't mean you can't, no, you can't really do analytical estimating very well at the start of a project. You tend to have to do it sort of a little way through, maybe in the definition phase of a linear life cycle, because it requires you to have enough information to be able to break down your project into its individual tiniest tasks um, to be able to estimate. The last one of the bottom-up estimating techniques is Delphi. And this is a, an estimate by consensus, a group workshop. So you have a group of experts um, from a variety of backgrounds, maybe where you don't have a project similar enough or there's not enough evidence from previous projects to kind of gather an estimate. So you say, let's grab some experts, maybe you know a few, maybe 10, 12, 15, et cetera, um, and get them to kind of put an estimate into a hat. We then pull an average out and say, right, here's the average. They all disagree, they all fight, et cetera, and they argue about it. You say, go away, come up with, have a discussion, come back again, we do the same activity again. So it's a generation of an estimate, or it says cost there, but it could be a time scale as well, um, through a, a workshop and team consensus with experts. So it's a group of experts usually. So how we present the estimates, um, again, guess these, all these techniques, those previous techniques, they can all be used to estimate costs and time. Obviously, this being a scheduling course, uh, a webinar, this is going to be times only I'm going to talk about. Um, but the first presentation we might get is something called uh, single point estimating, where we get one value. So I want to know how long it takes to decorate my, my living room. So I did my bedroom last week, and my bedroom's a little bit bigger. Bit less, you know, living is a bit smaller, a little bit less complicated. I reckon five days. So that's a single point estimate. We get, we get one value, um, very simple to put into a schedule, very easy to communicate. So if someone says, how long does it take to do a task, say five days, um, it's nice and easy to communicate, communicate, but it doesn't contain, it's not very realistic. 
And if it goes over five days, your stakeholders will go, you said it would take five days. It doesn't really consider uncertainty. So what we can do instead is something called a three-point estimating technique or a three-point estimate, which is where we get three values. We get a mid, uh, minimum value or optimistic or best case, it's sometimes known as, which is uh, we, if we push really hard and things go really well. So if I'm decorating my room, the wallpaper comes off in nice strips, there's no plastering to be done. Uh, that's my realistic scenario. Uh, sorry, my most optimistic scenario. Most likely, though, is what I expect to happen. Based on my previous experiences, I think it's probably going to end up being this. This is what I expect to happen. Then we have a pessimistic maximum or worst case scenario, which is if things go worse than expected, if I'm peeling off the wallpaper, it comes off with little chunks and I have to kind of chip it off. And there's loads of plastering to be done on the wall. It might take me 10 days rather than five. So we're considering risk here. Those three point estimating um, approach allows you to consider the opportunities of getting it done quicker than expected, what you expect it to be, and then the threat of it taking longer. So it's a more realistic and more useful in that regard. It's more effective for setting expectations and things like that with stakeholders. Problem with it is, which one would we pick to go into a schedule? Because we can't go with most likely because we're back to the single point estimate again, which is no, no longer considering uncertainty. We can't do, do we want to take worst case because then we overinflate our project, which may mean it looks more expensive or it's going to take longer than we than it probably will do. We don't want to take best case because everything's going to be unrealistic. Then it's going to be a struggle. It's unlikely we'll always look like we're behind schedule because it's very unlikely we'll hit our optimistic estimate for all our tasks. So, what we can do is what's called a weighted average, and the, there's a formula called a PERT formula that allows us to do that. And the formula is displayed there. So optimistic plus pessimistic, plus four times the most likely, because you added six numbers together, you divide by six. That gives you a weighted average. So it allows you to consider all three values, so the best case, worst case, and most likely, but weighs in favor of the most likely saying, it's called the most likely, so let's make it more likely than the others. Um, and that gives you this weighted average, which you can then use to put into a schedule, which does consider uncertainty. It's more realistic, but it's one value. So it means you can have a more defined schedule and a more defined budget if you're doing estimating and budgeting. Estimating is something that needs to be done all the way through the project lifecycle. I've seen many, many projects where estimating was done towards the start, everyone's given up estimating and then gone, right, this is the schedule, let's do, do this. When what they should be doing is doing some estimating at the start, and then when the schedule is underway, continuing to estimate, so to, uh, to help anticipate things that are going wrong, going better than expected. Um, and as we go, our estimates will get more accurate, which is something we often draw called the estimating funnel. Um, and the idea behind that, oops, excuse me, head there, yeah, over up to overexcited there. Um, the estimating funnel is about showing that, I mean, if you use a funnel to pour, I mean, I use it to put water in my um, engine, in, in the, my car, a funnel concentrates. So it starts wide, gets narrower. So the estimate, estimating does the same thing. It starts wide, it's gonna be quite a broad, quite a vague estimate, but as you go through your project, your estimates should, if you keep estimating, get more and more accurate. And it's often drawn as a funnel. Um, just to kind of illustrate that that happens if you keep estimating, just to encourage people to continue to estimate throughout the project. So part of scheduling will also be to do resourcing as well. I often kind of treat it as its own thing, resource management. We need a, a schedule to do resourcing. I'll come back to scheduling in a second. I just want to talk about resourcing for a second before I go back to developing the, what I think everyone's kind of keen to hear about, which is the critical path stuff. Um, resources can be anything we use, people, materials, equipment, vehicles, stuff. Money is a resource, but that's looked at through our budgets, and time is a resource, but that looks, that's looked at through our schedule, but people, materials, equipment, etc. And we have two types of resource, consumable, which is once the resource is used up, it's gone. So fuel, if you're speaking, speaking of cars, I mean fuel, once we've used the fuel, it's gone, that's it. Whereas we have reusable resources, which is the resources we can use over and over again. Um, so the car, machinery, equipment. People can be either, incidentally, people can be either consumable or reusable, depending on the type of contract we have with them. So if you're a permanent employee, you are a reusable resource of the your organization. If you have a temporary contract that's up in six months, and once that six months six month contract is over, you are consumed as a resource. The company would need to rewrite or do a new contract with you to secure your resource again. So people can be kind of either, depending on the contract they have with the project. So there's several resources management techniques. Resource management is kind of a generalized term looking at how we manage resources, what resources are needed for the project. 
Then we have resource allocation, which is to allocate resources to the project based on a schedule. So when do we need resources based on when tasks are happening? Are we having tasks in parallel with each other? When do we need to have resource the project? And resource optimization is a term that concerns itself with smoothing and leveling. So resource optimization is about increasing efficiency. It's about being as efficient as possible with our resources. So rather than having a big spiky schedule where we have loads of resource on the, the early on, then hardly anyone, then a load of people come back in, then they disappear again. We have we want to try and have a nice sort of flat project with, with regards to resourcing. So there's two techniques to go about achieving that. Smoothing is where the project is time critical and it uses something called total float or float to move tasks around without compromising the deadline. So it does no effect on the project duration. So it kind of, if you imagine um, a spiky project, that's like a, um, I always think of sand pits when I think of this. When you, when, you, when you build a sand pit, so to put your sand in, you pour your sand and it's all gonna be un uneven and spread out and it's not gonna be very smooth at all. It'd be, there'd be a, a, pit, a load of sand here and then it'll be sort of shallower towards one part of the sand pit. What we want is a nice smooth sand pit. So we get a rake and we drag it lightly across the top so that the peaks of the sand fill in the troughs. So it's a nice smooth surface, but we can't go outside the boundaries of that sand pit. Same with the project. We smooth out this, the, this project by filling the, the troughs in with the peaks. So it has a consistency across the project, but it does maintain um, the end date. But whenever, whenever you run a project, whenever you make a decision with a project, there's always a price to pay, whether it be money or not, it kind of depends. In this instance, the price you pay to smooth your project is you increase the risk. Float is kind of a buffer. So tasks have float on them, which means you could delay the task a little bit and have no effect on the end date. We can move tasks around within that buffer. If we use that buffer up, we increase the risk. Okay, I'll try and explain that again when I, when I bring up the diagrams in a minute. Then we have resource leveling, which is where we have a limit on the resources. So smoothing is time limited projects or uh, time limited scheduling. Resource leveling is we have a cap on our resources. We can't, we can't go be above a certain threshold with our resource, which means in order to manage our project within that threshold of resources, we flatten it. So we get our sandpit and go, you know what, let's smash off one end of the sandpit and just, we want to get the sand flat as possible, crack one end of the sandpit off and then run a bulldozer over it so it all spills out the end. It's like getting a tube of toothpaste and just flattening it. Toothpaste is all going to come out the end. Same with the project. If we say, right, we can't, we've got to have it flat as possible. We can't go above five resources, let's say. If there's tasks that require to have 10 resources all at once, then we have to acknowledge that the project duration is going to com be compromised. We have to give up the end date. So smoothing is time-limited scheduling. Leveling is resource-limited. We have a cap on our resources, which means we extend the project if necessary. So that's what leveling will answer. Based on the limits, how long will the project take? Here's the kind of sand pit analogy kind of sketched out a little bit. So with smoothing, we have a hard line on the right hand side there. That dotted line, that dotted vertical line on the right hand side is the end date. We can't go beyond that. So how, how smooth can we make this without going and squishing it so hard it goes beyond that right hand line, the end date? Whilst leveling is, we can't go above the horizontal dotted line. So we have that's squishing it down. So that's going to squish it down, flatten it. So it's probably going to squeeze out the end a little bit. How far it squeezes out the end will, will be dependent on how, how, where that horizontal line is. So that's kind of an illustrative uh, look at smoothing versus leveling. If you are interested in taking the PMQ, one of the things I often talk about when I teach this, uh, the PMQ, is to be very careful of muddling, smoothing, and leveling up, because I often see that causing problems in the PMQ where people have muddled up those definitions. So smoothing, just one last time, smoothing is for time-limited schedule. So there's a hard deadline we can't go beyond, which means we have to kind of fit our resources into that using total float. Leveling is there's a limit on our resources available. How long will the project take based on that limit? What you'll often find is we level the project first to work out what the end date is based on our resource limit, and then we smooth it out to, to iron out the peaks and troughs. <clears throat> so this is a critical path network or a, ne a network diagram, sorry, with, with the critical path stuff, and I will talk about that in a minute, which we then convert into a Gantt chart. I imagine some of you may have used Gantt charts. A Gantt chart is a way, is a visual look at one of these. So when I do these, when I when I used to do these, I don't do them much anymore. 
I always build one of these first. And then if I'm using software like Primavera 6 or Microsoft Project, it also will build me a Gantt chart based on that. It works really well if you do it that way around. So Gantt chart is a visual representation of your critical path stuff that's shown on a calendar. So what does the schedule look like with a start date of Monday? So rather than you know, a numerical start date, we have a actual start date. And the Gantt chart then says, based on that start date, based on the network diagram, what does this project look like? And it shows you a picture of that. Then you have your resources underneath your Gantt chart. You can program your Gantt chart to have resources underneath it like that. So there is smoothing. So we've got our unsmooth resources there. If you look, we have our spike and it kind of um, calms down a little bit. So we have hardly anyone on our project spikes up, then hardly anyone again. Smoothing is we have a, uh, fl a much flatter, smoother project, but we haven't gone beyond the end date there. We've kept our tasks within the total float, which is the dotted lines um, above the resource histogram there. And then with our leveling, you can see we've had to add an extra task to the critical path to squish it down as best we can. And we've increased the duration of the project. So that is kind of resourcing that is also estimating um are there any questions for me so far based on those uh yes um i've got a question here that says um you know so we use an estimating template to produce estimates um and they agree upon a tolerance so let's say plus or minus 25 percent for the sake of example um does, how does that fall into something like the three point estimate that you um, that you that you mentioned? When you say tolerance, in what way? So because when, when, there's with three point estimating, there they, there are tolerances in it, but it depends on what you're doing with it. Because you because we, there's something called Monte Carlo with you, that uses three point estimating, which has we basically take our three point estimates, and then we allow a tolerance between around each of them. So. So your minimum, your best case estimate has a tolerance around it going, from, let's say, for example, two, and then the tolerance is, you know, 0.5 above and below two, and then you have a tolerance for your most likely and a tolerance for your worst case as well. And then that Monte Carlo technique pulls an average of those estimates, all those variances all together and does it a thousand times and gives you a, an accurate estimate. But that's my understanding of tolerance there. Whether that aligns to this question, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, th I think that that would certainly make sense. I think, you know, like you say, you've, you've mentioned, mentioned Monte Carlo there and, um, you know, it, it just presents the idea that there is um, the ability to build tolerance into, in, into that, uh, into that. Um, yes. Estimating. So that was my understanding of it. So you can build tolerances in there and then you can use the tolerances to kind of simulate an estimate and come up with like, here's a best case, here's a worst case. And then let's, let's allow a bit of space around them to kind of come up with some more accurate estimates or more, even more realistic estimates. But that, that's my understanding anyway of that, yeah, so. Um, another question um, is uh, all around kind of estimating and the estimating funnel. Um, now, is it possible, um, I mean, I imagine the answer is, to this is yes. Is it possible to use varying methods during a project? So, yes. for example, um, if I need to wire up um, a building for broadband, I might start with a subjective estimate and go, oh, it's 500 grand. And then I might kind of look back uh, and look to a, an, an analogous project where I'd say, um, all right, so I wired up a building six months ago and it was 400 grand. So... And then so on and so on, all the way to kind of a, 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 a bottom up analytical one where you said, right, I've got all the materials in place now. It's going to cost yeah. this much. Yeah. I mean, so you can use any of them and I would encourage you to use. It. I mean, the only one that you don't see Delphi is the more un, is more uncommon, but the other three. So parametric, analogous and analytical are really what we should be using in our project. But in fact, how, analy how analytical works this is a word to try and say in the afternoon that. Um, analytical works is so we go right we, we work out how long each task takes so i used the light bulb earlier on so how long does it take to fit a light bulb well how long it takes to fit a light bulb will be well how when did i last fit a light bulb or let's go and speak to a light bulb expert who's done it for 20 years you've done light bulbs how long do you reckon it would take to fit a light bulb so your analytical estimate will be lots of small very detailed analogous or parametric estimates to build your analytical analytical estimate so in fact you are using all three at once to be able to do an analytical, an analytical estimate, um, typically. But what you might find as you get more and more detail throughout your project, 
as you learn more and more, and you're going, right, we've got, we've got all this data, we can do really good parametric estimate, we've got tons of historical data we've gathered, we've got really good breakdown structures, we know exactly what we're doing in our project. And as a result of finding all that out, we may go, actually, this is really similar to that project over there we hadn't considered, actually. Maybe it's going to look at their risk registers and let's go look at their estimating and their budgets and see, because ours is looking almost, at, now we've learned more about our own project, we see it aligns to that other project really closely. Let's go and take a look at that project and see if we can find any similarities we can use to build even better estimates. And that could, so you, analogous is often, people often dismiss it as we use it at the start and then we never use it again. But actually we can use it throughout to verify other estimates and vice versa. We can use parametric to ver ver verify analogous. We can use analytical to confirm what we expected at the start. I mean, so yes, you can use a variety of techniques all the way through the project. And I would encourage you to, you should be using a variety because if you get different perspectives will get you more accuracy and more information. And those three offer different perspectives on an estimate. So. Oh, great, great answer. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's good to see that, you know, it's of course possible to, use all of those different methods to kind of maximize the maximize the value to your estimate yeah um, and make sure that um make sure that you're producing that that funnel like you know like we spoke about you know as as, as you get more detail um, mm. and like you say it encourages that that uh, encourages that ability to estimate all the way through the project life cycle so uh you know and I, i've seen projects where you, you know they've gone right that that'll be roughly it from the start and then and yeah. then they wonder why it's all going wrong see I work in I worked in defense. That was that was the world. <laughs> I, lo I love that you call it subjective <coughs> estimate as well. I would call it a finger in the air. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I saw a lot of that. So I mean, that's, that's that's the reality. And that's what if we do robust estimate, if we do estimating throughout, we can really push back on um, fingers in the air estimates for someone says, I think it'll cost 50 grand. No, yeah, I don't know, 50 grand. When we get more, if we gather information, we can get I mean, particularly analytical estimating, because that's a huge piece of evidence you have. Mm. Um, to say, well, actually, you've given me 50 grand in the business case, but based on breaking your project and this idea down into small, tiny parts and working out how, how much each individual part costs and how long each individual part will take, you're going to need to give me more than 50 grand. Here's why. And you can give them the breakdown structure and say, here's why. And you have all that evidence to, to show why you need more money. Rather than just going to them, I think we need a bit more cash. They go, why? And you go, I don't know, I just feel like it. If you provide evidence to your stakeholders, you'll you're more likely to get that funding and that backing that um, you might need to pr to prove your project is or to deliver your project successfully. So I I've, estimating is incredibly important, and a project is built on estimates. I mean, everyone, the, as I said earlier on, estimating is a guess. It is a guess. It's it's an informed guess, and people forget that the whole project is based on guessing. It's a guess. We we think it's going to cost this. And if we don't go, we need to double check that all the way through to make sure we think, you know, that the start is, is okay, that thinking is, is right. Then we just get more and more wrong as we just let it get, as we gather more information, don't do anything with it. It's going to get more and further and further away from that initial estimate. The whole project is an estimate. And it's just, it's going to continue to be an estimate until it's finished. Because it's, it's, a project's all about proactivity and being and thinking ahead and what might happen. Um, and estimates will help you to understand what might happen. No, great answer. And um, so that's um, uh, that's all the time we've got for questions there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, no, no, that's that's fine. And I think uh, we are now at the point where I, I think we could probably consider this the uh, the main event of yeah. today, and and that is uh, the critical path analysis. So, uh, Callum, I will hand over oh, to you. Thank you very much. Right. So, as a, yeah, as Jake said, and as I'm kind of expecting, this is the 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 piece everyone wants to know about a little bit, perhaps because. I think if you work in projects, chances are you've experienced estimating in some way. Chances are if you've worked in projects, you've used Gantt charts in some way. Um, but the critical path thing, I, as I said, this is, if I had to pick one thing I find the most interesting and the most, the most thing I enjoy most about project management, it's not scheduling, it's critical path analysis. I love this. I think it's incredibly helpful. So there is a network diagram. It has a load of numbers on it. So each of these boxes is called a node. They're called nodes. And in each node, there is seven pieces of information that we need to have gathered about our project. In the middle section there, in the wide middle section, we have the activity name and ID. In our work breakdown structure, we should have given the task a name and give it an identifying number as well, or some kind of code that will allow us to track it and monitor it and everything without, having to, without losing sight of it. 
So we put that, that name and that code into the middle section. Top left, we have the earliest we could possibly start that task. In the middle, we have our duration. In the earliest, on the top right, we have our earliest finish. In the bottom left, we have the latest start. Bottom middle, middle, we have our total float. And in the bottom right, we have our latest finish. What they kind of all mean, I'll go through as we go. The piece we need to have before we can do a critical path analysis is the duration. So that's why we talked about estimating first, because we need to have done our estimates to figure out all the durations of these tasks before we can do a critical path analysis. Because the first thing we populate is the durations. So that's what it will look like. When you've, when you've gathered your estimates, you'll populate your task with a duration that goes in the top middle there. And when we do critical path analysis, there's three steps to doing it. And if I'm being perfectly honest, software does this all for you. Now, you can use Microsoft Project Primavera 6 or any other variety of software. I mean, even Excel, I think, could be programmed to do this. You can just do it and let programs and computers sort it out for you. But I think, like anything, it pays to know what's, what it's doing. Because people slide documents under your, your nose all the time and go, here you go. And if you have no idea what it's actually saying and you don't know where it's come from, that it's going to be very hard to challenge it. And then when, it, when stuff doesn't work for you or does, goes wrong in the project, you can't really spot why. So I think it pays to know how the software is doing this. So the critical path analysis is trying to work out this thing called a critical path. What the critical path is, park for a second. What total flow is, I'll park for a second, OK? There's three steps we go through to do critical path analysis, the first of which is called a forwards pass. The forwards pass is working from left to right across the diagram. And this is a mathematical look at your project. This is not a, when, what's, what's the day it starts on? What's the date it starts on? This is purely mathematically, what's the earliest we can start a project. So the top left of activity A is the earliest start for the whole project. The earliest we can begin anything in mathematically is zero. So to do the forwards pass then, we wanna work across the tops of the nodes. So we wanna try and figure out the earliest finish for activity A there. And to do that, we do the earliest start plus duration. So zero plus five will give us five. So earliest start plus duration will tell us the earliest finish. Then what we do is we take the earliest finish for activity A, and because activity B and C are dependent on activity A, we can't start B and C until A has finished. We, if we're effectively saying there, once activity A finishes on day five, then we could start activity B and C, which means they both they could start on day five. The earliest those activity B and activity C could begin is on day five. If we're using days, you could use hours and months or weeks, whatever. I'm using days here to keep it simple. To do the same thing again, we want to add the five to the two for activity B. So earliest start is five, duration is two. So that gives us uh, an earliest finish of seven for activity B. And same for C, five and three gives us an earliest finish of eight. Now activity D has two tasks dependent on it. So we have the activity B and activity, T, activity C need to have been finished before we can begin doing activity D. Now, so that means activity D absolutely has to wait until both B and C are finished, but one of them finishes on day seven, one of them finishes on day eight. So we have to take the highest number when we choose. So when more than, two, more than one arrow goes into an activity, when there's an opportunity for a higher and lower, lower number, we take, we take the highest number. So we have activity B finishes on, finishing on day seven, activity C finishes on day eight, activity D will start on eight then. Because it can't start until both are finished, activity C finishes last, so we have to wait for the highest number. Activity E cannot begin until C has finished. So notice where the arrows are going there. There's only one arrow going into activity E and it's coming from activity C, which means it has nothing to do with B and nothing to do with D. So activity E carries that eight down the arrow. So notice how I'm doing this. I'm going columns. I'm literally working in columns as I do it. And I will always, if you, if you have, if you ever given one of these to analyze or to look through or double check or whatever, I always try and work through it in columns. I think it makes it much easier than trying to work left to right. Cause this is a really, really simple version of one these can get incredibly complicated. So I always think working in columns makes it much simpler to go through them. So activity D, earliest finish is gonna be nine because eight and one is nine. Activity E, eight and five is 13. So again, like earlier on with activity D, we have two arrows going into activity F there. So activity D finishes on day nine and activity E finishes on day 13. F is dependent on both D and E. So we have to wait for the last task to finish. Highest number is 13, take the 13 down the arrow. 
13 plus three gives us a duration of project 16 days. So our forwards pass will tell me or tell us our project team or whoever how long the project's going to take. It also indicates why it's going to take that long because it shows all the durations and adds them up. It'll tell you how long your overall project duration will be. So that's the forwards pass. The second step of critical path analysis is to do what's called a backwards pass. And the easiest way to remember the backwards pass is it's the opposite of everything we've just done on the forwards pass. We, we inverse it all. So we start at the right hand side and work left and we're working across the bottom. So we take our latest um, finish and we subtract our duration. So the latest finish, so note, that the earliest finish is 16, our latest finish is also going to be 16. The reason for that is effectively, we've already figured out how long we want the project to take. We think it's going to take 16 days. If we change that and say, actually, we could take up to 20 days, that's artificially extending your project longer than it needs to. We, we already said, based on our durations, we think this project is going to take 16 days. Therefore, we don't want it to take any longer than 16 days either. So that's the latest finish. We literally carry the earliest finish back down underneath there to be the latest finish for the whole project too. So as I said, we're working back down from right to left there. So we're after the latest start. So latest finish minus duration. So 16 minus three gives us a latest start of 13. We then carry that down the arrow. So the latest start gets carried back down the arrows right to left to be the latest finish for the previous task. So activity D is feeding into activity F there. And so is task E. So the latest those two could finish is day 13. Hopefully everyone's following on with me. I appreciate this is, this is a, this is the thing everyone gets is always interested in with scheduling is this bit. So, you know, let me know in the questions if there's been confusion. Um, so latest start for D is 13 subtract one there to give us an, a, a latest start of 12. Again, working in columns going backwards. So I'm not going to C or B just yet. I'm look at activity E. So activity E is 13 take five to get a, a latest start of eight. So we have D going back into B and C here. So there's two arrows coming from, going sort of out of D going backwards. So we carry that 12 back down the arrow to be the latest finish for B. So that 12 goes there. Um, where we have two arrows going back into a task though, is the opposite of everything we've just done on the forwards pass. So we take the lowest number. So we have a choice for activity C, we could take either 12 or eight. We carry the eight as it's the lowest. And the reason we carry the lowest number is because if we, if task C finishes any later than eight, it would interfere with the latest start of task E. A later start means that is the latest that task can begin. We can't task, start task E later than day 12. So therefore we can't finish activity C any later than day eight. Oh, sorry, activity E can't start any later than day eight. Activity C can't start, uh, finish any later than day eight. So again, working in columns, activity B, 12 subtract two gives me 10. Activity C, eight subtract three gives me five. I have two numbers to choose from there. I've got 10 or five to be the latest finish for A. I carry the lowest number, five. Five subtract five to get me the latest start of my project will give me zero. So this is one of the reasons I really like critical path analysis is that it checks itself. It can check it. You can, it can check your maths for you. And that's one of the ways it checks it. If you get anything other than zero, if you've used this approach to it, where you've carried the latest, the latest finish is also the same as the latest, uh, sorry, the latest finish is the same as the earliest finish for the whole project in the last task. If you do this the right way, you will get back to zero. If you get anything other than zero, something's gone awry in your maths. So the third and final step then is the total float to work out how much buffer do these tasks have. And to do that, we do the latest start, subtract the earliest start, or the latest finish, subtract the earliest finish. So if we look at activity A, the latest start is zero. The earliest start is also zero. So zero subtract zero would be zero. The latest finish is five to activity A, the earliest finish is five. So five subtract five also gives us zero. So the total float for activity A is zero. Activity B, 10 subtract five is five. 12 subtract seven is also five. So that gives me a total float of five. Activity C, five subtract five is zero. Eight subtract eight is also zero. So total float for C is zero. Activity D has a total float of four because 12 subtract eight is four. 13 subtract nine is also four. 
Activity E, eight subtract eight is zero. 13 subtract 13 is also zero. And activity F, also zero. So the tasks with zero total float, they are my critical path. Okay, so I'll talk about free float in a second, actually. So those mean, so activities A, C, E, and F have zero total float, which means if any of those tasks are late, the project will be late. Whilst activity B could be late by up to five days, because there's a total float of five in there in the bottom middle, um, which is what that bottom middle is, the total float, it has a, to a total float of five days, which means I could delay this task by up to five days and my project would still take me 16 days. So it's my buffer, my wiggle room, my flex time, whatever you want to call it. Whereas a task with zero total float in the bottom middle is on the critical path. You will always have a line of zeros through your project if you've done it this way. There'll always be a line of zeros. And that will indicate to you any of those tasks relate on the critical path, the duration of the project will be gone. We will do, it will be later than expected. So it gives us an idea of where the risk will lie to our project schedule. That's what the critical path will show. So total float versus free float then. So total float is the total float for a task. So for example, activity B has a total float of five, which means how much buffer have we got before we delay the end of the project? So I've got up to five days, I could delay B by and still deliver the project within 16 days. Free float, on the other hand though, is how much time can I, can I delay a task by and it not interfere with the start of the next task. So activity B, we could because it because activity B finishes on day seven, activity D finish, uh, begins on day eight, I could delay task B by up to one day and activity D would start on exactly the same day. So total flow is how much buffer have I got before I affect the end of the project. Free flow is how much buffer I've got before I interfere with my schedule, as in I won't have to move tasks around to accommodate any late tasks. If activity B is late by a single day, then my project schedule is exactly the same. No task, activity would start on day eight exactly as expected. So it's free float because it's free. It has no effect on your schedule. It just allows you some space without it compromising any delays to other tasks or anything like that. So we like free float, but it's not, it's not that common. We, don't, we like to get, get look, we should be looking for it because it's useful to us because it allows us some freedom to move things around a little bit without giving up any, without giving up any scheduling or arrangements or replanning when people arrive or anything. It's schedule is exactly as it is, provided you don't go over that one day free float that B has. So there's a couple of advantages of critical path analysis. There's a few. It's visual. It use, again, as I said, for me, it's effectively assembling a work breakdown structure into a logical order. It's very visual. It establishes relationships between tasks with those arrows. So finish to start, we have one task finishing, then the next one can begin. It shows you a logical sequence. It allow you to build a really robust baseline, which becomes, so this turns into a Gantt chart. Um, which allows you to track and monitor and show and baseline your project more effectively and go, right, here's the schedule based on a really nice mathematical critical path. Um, it will show delays in the project. It will show your path of risk there. So the critical path shows you the path with the, right, uh, the highest risk to your deadline. It doesn't mean the most important tasks necessarily. It simply says those tasks are the highest risk of the project schedule if they're late. And the thing I find incredibly helpful with critical path analysis and these diagrams in general, is they help me to identify missing activities because this is about logic. It's about putting your tasks, these dependencies and arrows are all based on putting everything to a logical sequence. If there's gaps in the logical sequence, probably means there's a task missing. So you then go, okay, let's add that to the work breakdown structure, work out what it ties into, and then we can put it into my schedule. So it really helps to identify gaps in your logic because it's all about building your project into a logical flow. So the very last thing I will very quickly whiz through these. We have different types of dependencies. Don't worry too much about them. Um, finish to start is when one task finishes, then the next one can begin. Start to start is once one task has started, then the next task can begin. Finish to finish is once one task is finished, then the next one can finish. Um, and start to finish, bad practice, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, I don't I don't recommend start to finish. It doesn't really work very well. Um, certainly not in our project schedule it work. It doesn't really work very well. It is very much considered bad practice. So I'm going to leave it there for start to finish. All right. Finish to start is the most common. That's the one I would always lean towards. I, I would always try and use finish to start if I can because it, it gives you a lot more control over your project than start to start or finish to finish. Um, so finish to start is the one I try and build your schedule into. So we have lead and lag time as well. 
Um, so lag time is where we delay a task starting. So for example, we this example, we do our first coat of paint. We have to wait two days, so plus two in the middle there on the arrow. That indicates we need to wait two days before we do the second coat. Lead time is um, we could start, so one, with the first coat of paint there, we could start doing the second coat 30 days before the end of the first coat finishing. So it allows you some flexibility within your task. So we can lead, it's overlap basically, and the lead time is how much overlap can there be between tasks. So in instance here, this instance here, we can overlap the first coat and second coat by 30 days. So we have a minus 30 on the arrow there. Both of them are generally not used anymore. Most of the time we have dummy tasks in there or we, we include the durations or the overlap in the actual task duration. Um, it, it's about giving us more control and making things simpler. That's it. That's scheduling. Fantastic. Um, so um, the critical path is, uh, I always find it's something that generates, generates lots of questions. And <coughs> pardon me, uh, today is no exception. Um, so um, I've, got a, I've got a few questions here. Um, right. And uh, I will just start with them now. Um, so I have a question here that says, um, well, I'm sure the critical path is created in definition after the WS has been made. Um, is the critical path something that gets updated through the life cycle or is it a baseline to compare to once the project is complete? So kind of like estimated <coughs> work versus actual work. So um, the schedule should be updated. And if you update the schedule, so if you're using software, if you update the Gantt chart, it will also update your critical path analysis and vice versa. They, they, the project is the one I always think of. If you update one, it updates the other automatically and so on and so forth. So you baseline your project. That's, what you, that's effectively your, your agreed starting point, but you can change that. Um, one, of the, one of the problems I always see is, I, I would always say if you, I would just, you need to update the schedule <laughs> as you go. If you don't update the schedule to reflect what's actually happening, um, critical path, Gantt chart, whatever you're using to monitor your schedule, Gantt chart more likely, um, then your schedule will always be wrong. So yes, you need if you need to change the schedule, um, if you change the Gantt chart or change the critical path, so basically they're one and the same thing really. Um, if you change the schedule, then yes, you you would you yeah you would need to do that. You would have to keep an eye on the schedule. You have to change it to reflect what's currently happening. Otherwise, it'll always be wrong. So. Okay, that's great. Um, so what about, um, uh, I've got a question here that um, asks, do we use the critical path in iterative life cycles? Uh, no, not really. Um, iterative life cycles use time boxing rather than uh, scheduling in the strictest sense. So uh, linear life cycles are effectively saying, right, we have a timeline. What does the timeline look like? We look at how the tasks fit onto a timeline. So some tasks will take a few days, some tasks might take a couple of weeks. They might have different durations. Um, based on what we need to do in that sort of linear timeline. With an iterative life cycle, everything's broken into four week, two to four week chunks called time boxing, um, which means we don't really need, we don't need to build a schedule like in the same way uh, as a linear project because we know everything's going to take two to four weeks and we decide whether it's going to be two to four weeks before we begin the two to four weeks. Um, so it doesn't really work in an iterative life cycle because you're kind of repeating yourself over and over again whilst you're linear, you're going forwards all the time, hence why you need the critical path. Okay, great. Um, so uh, another question I have here is, can you have more than one critical path? Yes, <laughs> you can have many. You'll always have at least one, um, but you can have many critical paths. Okay, um, and... Uh, just going back to um, touching on smoothing and leveling uh, as how they relate to the critical path. Um, so if we, um, if we smooth out resources uh, on a project, um, is it possible to create more critical paths by using up float? Yes, <laughs> in a nutshell. So when you're using up your total floats, you're, you're, again, you're increasing risk. But what you can do is if you leave a bit of total float on there, that means you're leaving a small buffer. If you remove that buffer, you've added a critical task, which means you're adding, a, you're potentially adding critical paths on there, but you, you might be adding, you'll certainly be adding critical tasks onto the project. Um, so yes, you can increase your, you can add critical paths by smoothing, yes. Great, um, I mean, it's uh, one of those things, critical path was uh, when I first did my project management training, it was something to, uh, 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 you know, it forced me to sit down and be logical. That's kind of, it. that's why I like it, because uh, it, it you have to be logical with it. And I'm quite a logical person. I, I quite like sort of 
tinkering <laughs> and critical path is very much here's your project as a kind of splay of do, not uh, you know not nonsense but like tasks that don't really tell you what everything's going to look like at the end mm. you basically take all those tasks you put it into this puzzle and you try and solve the puzzle what's the best way of doing this project what's the best order and then when you do that at the end at the end of that activity you have your project and your critical path analysis is literally a picture of your project and i i, I love all that you see i find it really helpful because i'm a very visual person you see oh, i mean it's great i mean when i did my training i fortunately did my training with with training bite size and and it was just so great to just you know use use all the exercises that were offered just to really get my get my thinking into line i thought it was really easy accessible and i really enjoyed it as a learning experience but um Fab, I've got uh, one more question here. We've got time for one more to squeeze it in. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who's uh, currently doing the PMQ course um, and uh, they've come across a question before that compares the critical path to the critical chain. Yeah. Um, and it can be a bit uh, difficult sometimes to, to understand the difference. Is that, you know, is yeah. that something yeah. you wouldn't mind touching on briefly? I'll do my best. So this is what I, th I find easiest to draw, this one to explain. So critical path is... What does the project look like realistically? So you use your realistic estimate. So you do your three-point estimating, then you take a weighted average, which is a realistic estimate of your project. And then if you don't mind, I'm going to go back a couple of slides to help me explain this. That's all right, because this is, this is a question, this one. <laughs> um, so there's a critical, this is a critical path analysis. So effectively what we're doing here is activity um, D begins on day eight. Okay, so um, because activity C finishes on day eight, so what we'll do then is we'll bring our resources in when we need them, because that's realistic. There's no point having all of our resources, all the people who need to do the project. Let's imagine uh, Activity D is the electrician, for example, building a house. This is a project to build a house, and they, uh, Activity D is the electrician doing the electrical stuff. Um, if um, the electrician is hired, we won't hire the electrician on day zero. We don't need the electrician to turn up on day zero because they're not required until day eight. But if task B or C finish on day six, let's say, it won't make any difference to our schedule if they finish early because the electrician will still turn up on day eight because that's when they've been scheduled to turn up. So it's a realistic look at our project, which, but to, to manage the threat of it, you're also perhaps losing opportunities to get things done quicker because you re bring resources onto your project when you need them. Resource, uh, so critical chain is where we say, right, cost be damned, we want this project done in its best case. So we take, our, we take our realistic estimates, that generates the realistic end date for our project. And then we go, right, what's the best cases for all these tasks? And that will give us a best case end date. And then the difference between the realistic end date and the best case estimate will give us a buffer that we have to work with it. So we want it to be quicker than the, the realistic, and we're aiming for the best case, but anything better than realistic is, is brilliant. We're happy with that. But in order to do that, you tend to, well, to get that to, to get that best case outcome you bring as many resources as you can onto the project right from the start so for example if we're doing critical chain we'll get the electrician to be there on day one the moment the project starts the electrician's right there the electrician is paid but the electrician is just sitting around on a chair waiting for them to do to do start the electrician stuff that means if the activity b and c finish early so if they finish on day six for example we go prod the electrician say you're up and it doesn't mean we have to wait for them to arrive. They're already on the project. So it's kind of pushing the project to get, I used to do it in defense quite a lot, where you have projects that are urgent and they had to be done quick, but cost was not a problem. So we cost is an issue. We need this done as quickly as possible because there's a threat to life, there's a threat to situation or whatever. We want it done quicker than um, quicker than we need than, than we planned rather than on budget. So you kind of throw money at it, throw resources, because if the resources are all there, then they can start the moment a task is finished rather than waiting for when they're scheduled to turn up, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, fantastic. And um, so I think that brings us uh, pretty much to the to the end of uh, today's session. Um, so, Cal, if you wouldn't mind just nipping to the uh, slides at the end. Yeah, sorry, I just quickly. go right to the end there. No problem. Two seconds. There That's we go. fine. Um, Oops. Uh -huh. So, we do have uh, a number of training options available to you um, here at Training Bite Size, whether that is self paced online study um, or face to face training, classroom training. You know, please do get in touch with us at learning at trainingbitesize.com and we will be able to help you to explore your options. Um, one of the questions I've uh, had a few times during the uh, session is 
whether it will be made available on demand? And the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Um, so the video with the slides will be made available to watch on demand on YouTube. So um, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on LinkedIn. Um, and I've just popped the links there into the uh, chat. Um, so for those of you also in the future watching on YouTube, I'll also put links to everything, including a free uh, APM PMQ Box 7 demo in the video description down below. Um, so the very last thing for me to say to you for today, and final time, slide Callum, please, is thank you. Um, thank you to all of you for attending today's session, uh, for submitting your questions, and or uh, for making it a really kind of exciting, engaging session where we've been able to kind of sink our teeth into all these topics. So uh, thank you uh, also to Callum for, uh, for leading today's session. But yes, the biggest thank you has to go to all of you watching. Um, we have some more episodes of Light Bites in the pipeline and we're planning them uh, as we speak. So when they uh, come out, we will be in touch with everybody to let you know that there are more episodes coming up and you will be able to sign up and attend live and catch up um, on demand as well. So uh, we hope you have a fantastic uh, rest of your day and um, I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you very much. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.